On this week's episode of Amari Purple Talk, are we still getting a Prince documentary from Netflix? And who's the director? My final word on Lemon Cake Gate and more. Amari Purple Talk starts now. Welcome to episode 36 of Amari Purple Talk, a Prince podcast where I share my thoughts on the Prince musical singularity. I'm Richard Cole, your imagination funk soloist, and let's start today's show. And we're going to start with the uh, Prince documentary uh, that is in development at Netflix. I heard a bit of a rumor. Uh, There's no official word from the estate and no official word from Netflix. But however, from a source um, that Ezra Edelman is going to be tapped as the director of the Netflix documentary. And those that are unfamiliar with Ezra Edelman, uh, he's an Emmy winning filmmaker. He won an Emmy as well as an Oscar for directing OJ Made in America. Uh, That's a documentary not to be confused uh, with the television miniseries uh, about OJ Simpson, which had uh, Cuba Gooding Jr., uh, John Travolta. Uh, The OJ Made in America documentary Uh, That was on Netflix for a while, Um, but you can catch it on, if anyone has the ESPN app, uh, you can find it there. I believe you can watch it for free. Uh, I've seen about maybe half of that documentary, uh, never got around to completing it, Uh, but what I did see was very powerful and pretty riveting documentary, so... Just based on the two, I think about two two parts that I had seen of it. This is probably the best qualified for the job. Now, earlier, uh, Ava DuVernay was originally tapped as the director uh, due to, I guess, possible creative differences. Uh, she is no longer attached to the project. Which I covered that in episode one of Amari Purple Talk. That was one of our very first main topics as to who would replace Ava DuVernay. Now, she's done some very powerful documentaries as well as television or Netflix miniseries. And she, too, is highly qualified to direct a Prince documentary. I think that with Prince's world view and the things that matter to him beyond, you know, just the music, um, you know, his activism, quiet as a lot of it was, a lot of it came through the music, uh, a lot of it came through, through example, uh, a lot of stuff that's just now coming to light um, that he wanted to remain anonymous about, but, you know, the philanthropy, all of that. Um, again, like I said, Ava DuVernay wasn't a bad choice, but if you're going to replace her as a director, then definitely, for me, Ezra Elderman is a perfect choice as well. So, I don't know, like I said, again, nothing has been confirmed by either the estate or by Netflix, but if this happens, I'm excited to see it. And as I'm going over some of his filmography, uh, a lot of it is sports related. Uh, The OJ Made in America was initially produced for ESPN's 30 for 30. Uh, That's a series, a series of great documentaries on a lot of key historic moments in sports, as well as some great historical figures in sports as well. Uh, But let's see, 
Uh, he's done sports documentaries for HBO Sports. Uh, let's see, Magic and Bird, A Courtship of Rivals. Uh, one I'm curious to seek out is The Curious Case of Kurt Flood. Um, for those that are unfamiliar with Kurt Flood, uh, he was the first one to advocate for free agency in the sports world. Uh, he played for the St. Louis Cardinals, although he was unable to fully reap the benefits of what he accomplished. However, that did open the door for a lot of sports figures uh, to gain some kind of stable financial footing, you know, once their respective careers have ended or to be fairly compensated during their uh, during their career as well. And again, like I said, this would be a perfect fit. I would think even a better fit uh, due to the fact of based on this Kurt Flood documentary, the concept of, again, freedom, ownership, you know, which are two key themes uh, that Prince was very, very consistent about probably throughout his whole career. You know, first at a young age, fighting for the freedom to produce and call the shots on his own music then later being able to call or being able to fight for ownership of his creative works. So, you know, again, like I said, this would be a very, very good fit. Again, I think that Ava DuVernay would have done a fantastic job as well. Like I said, if you check out uh, her documentary 13, uh, which is about the relationship of the 13th Amendment and the prison system. Again, another very powerful piece. And I'm sure that, you know, if Prince was still around, he would have found a way to work with her in some capacity. But again, if you can't have Ava DuVernay direct a Prince documentary, Ezra Elderman is a pretty good choice as well. So... Again, I guess until we get official word, um, check back here, hear my thoughts on what happens uh, when that's announced. And like I said, I know I'm going to be excited about it. Hopefully we'll get some announcements, maybe kind of when things start to wind down a bit or as soon as things can reopen and we can try to resume life as we prefer it then, I don't know, like I said, I'm very excited to, to hear what's going to happen with this. So, again, no official word from the estate or Netflix, but like I said, I'm going to follow this and keep you up to date. But what's most important is what do you think? Um, do you think Ezra Edelman is a good fit? Have you seen any of his um, documentaries? Um, or who do you think should be a good director? Uh, leave me a comment below and let me know your thoughts and from there we are going to move on to our next topic and our next topic is going to be will lockdown delays affect future prince releases all right so of course you know we're all living in a world where things change by the minute Nothing's ever set in stone. You know, my work schedule is an example of it. Um, but, you know, it's uh, some pretty heavy times. And a lot of things, especially in the entertainment world, um, movie theaters are closed. Movie studios stop production on a lot of releases. Things that were scheduled to be released have been pushed back. Maybe a year, maybe a little bit longer, or six months ahead. You know, nobody knows. Nobody knows when anything is coming out at this point. Um, but how it affects, I would say, everything in the Prince musical singularity, uh, as we've seen the delay of One Night Alone, all the up the back can't talk up all night 
alone releases, the Rainbow Children reissues, all of that has been delayed till May 29th, so far, still. Um, but the bigger question is how is all of this going to affect Warner Brothers? And the reason being that we're, what, about, uh, about seven, almost seven and a half months or less, no, almost seven months period, almost seven months away from 2021. And in 2021, I'm not sure of the exact date. I don't know what the contract would entail. However, 2021 is the year when Sony will gain control of all of the Warner Brothers master tapes of Prince, uh, with the exception of Purple Rain, Parade, Graffiti Bridge, and the Batman soundtrack. And that's just because those four being movie soundtracks, um, there's a separate contract when it comes to making a motion picture and that, I guess, motion picture contract, they retain the rights to the soundtrack because I guess it's part, of the, it's part of the marketing for the films. So with that said, then everything else, so say For You, Prince, um, Around the World in a Day, Diamonds and Pearls, the Symbol album, things like that. Those master recordings will be under license to Sony. Now, for clarification, the Prince Estate owns all of the master recordings. They own the Warner Brothers material, and they own everything since Prince's emancipation from Warner Brothers. But when Prince was alive in 2014, he got control of all of his Warner Brothers material and apparently signed a license agreement uh, for things such as, for example, the Purple Rain um, remastering and eventually Purple Rain Deluxe Edition that we have now. So that contract was in play all the way until 2021. Now, since Prince's passing, there was controversy surrounding a deal that the Prince estate made with Universal. Now, I believe Universal still has a valid license agreement in regards to Prince's publishing, which means that if a commercial wants to utilize a Prince song, then they have to negotiate with the estate or Universal for the rights to use the song in a commercial. Or if you're an artist and you want to cover a Prince song, then you have to negotiate with Universal and then they you know, you set a license agreement for that. But the master recordings, meaning that, say, for a commercial or film, you want to use that actual record, then you got to go through them to get it. So if you say, like, if you're going to sample something and you want a copy of the master tape and you want to sample, say, whatever, Erotic City and sample that, say, for your song or your rap tune or whatever, then you would have to, in that instance, you'd have to go through not only the estate, you have to go through Warner Brothers to get a hold of the master recording. But the estate owns all of the master recordings, both Universal and the materials that are being reissued by Sony. And they're just licensing agreements. I mean, if the estate really wanted to, then they could sell Prince albums out the back of their car all day, every day. But the logistics of getting any packaging, whether it's a super deluxe, whether it's a reissue, whether it's a brand new compilation like originals, then getting that stuff into the stores, getting it into Amazon, 
getting it to wherever the radio stations, all of that is facilitated through a major record label. They have access to the distribution companies and all of that. And again, that's another conversation about ownership that, I don't know, we may tackle somewhere down the road. But just for clarification on this situation, it's a lot of money and it is a big deal to be on the phone and negotiating percentages and how many cases need to be shipped here, there, and you know, how many are going to England, how many are getting to China, how many are getting to, you know, Africa, whatever, you know, so it's a lot of work. So you need a something, a big channel like a record company or some type of relationship with a major distributor to facilitate getting everything into our hands. So again, the estate owns all of those masters, both Warner Brothers and the material that everything Prince has done since 1995 that Sony has the rights to. They own that. But again, we're coming to seven months away from 2021. And what's Warner Brothers going to do? Now, we used we posed the question a few months ago or earlier in the year about since it is the last year that Warner Brothers will have possession of the classic material is what should they come out with next? And we've done polls on this show. Um, will it be sign of the times? Will they swing for the fences, try to get a big cash grab before they have to give it all away? Or play it, I don't know if you want to call it playing it safe, but just going ahead and releasing Parade. There's been a rumor that the Parade Super Deluxe has been finished for a long time. But this year, earlier this year, there was a rumor that there was going to be a Sign of the Times Super Deluxe Edition uh, to be released around June. Um, of course, no official word from the estate and no official word from Warner Brothers. And since right now everything is in sort of flux, you know, again, we don't know what, if anything, is coming out at this point. So with that being said, since everything is being pushed back, if there was a marketing plan for either a Sign of the Times Deluxe Edition or Parade Super Deluxe Edition, then whatever was being kept hush-hush until the appropriate time, meaning that here we are at the end of April, and had it not been for a lockdown, the possibility exists that we would have had an announcement either late in March or sometime during this month for any type of Warner Brothers release. You know, and it doesn't necessarily mean that Warner Brothers still couldn't come out with something in 2021. I mean, if it was a Sign of the Times Deluxe Edition, yeah, that would probably end up going on the shelf um, if this extends even further. Um, meaning that if something was originally supposed to come out in June, and let's just say for argument's sake that it is a sign of the time super deluxe edition, they could still release that in time for Christmas. So I don't really see a problem there unless things get to the point to where something could not be ready in time for Christmas. Meaning that, you know, as far as the marketing, as far as the distribution channels, uh, right now, like I said, everything is in flux. So even once things start to reopen, and let's say that maybe by June, worse, you know, or July, and everybody's just in the beginning stages of reopening, if you take something like the movie industry or the record industry, then you're talking about the logistics of 
rehiring everyone that has been laid off. You're talking about restarting your supply chains, um, reconnecting with distribution channels, and then the distribution channels, since nothing is being produced, there's no vinyl that's being pressed at the moment. There are no CDs that are being pressed at the moment. So therefore, you have to rehire all those people. And you still have to get your supply chain going to get the materials and supplies that you need to get that going and back in operation. So it's not going to be a thing of, you know, here's a month, two months, three months, four months of a lockdown. And then the first day after that fourth month, everything is reopened and it's business as usual. Uh, this is going to be something that we're going to be dealing with the ripple effect for quite a while. So with that being said, if based on that, if they're unable to have a product ready, and even in time for Christmas. Then, like I said, Warner Brothers could still do something, but it I, the worst case scenario in this would be it would not be a sign of the times super deluxe edition, but they would just go ahead and roll out parade. Since they'll retain ownership of that as long as Warner Brothers still has the motion picture rights to Under the Cherry Moon. So that, like I said, that would be the worst case scenario. Now, on a brighter side, you know, the estate or Warner Brothers can talk with the estate. The estate could talk with Sony. Sony Warner Brothers work something out and maybe said Sign of the Times Deluxe Edition could come out in early 2021. Now, I'm, I would be excited for a Sign of the Times Super Deluxe Edition and would not be mad if one was going to be released this year. And if one was officially going to be released, then, you know, they would have my dollars and I would have it and we'd be talking about it on the show. Uh, but really deep down inside something like sign of the times just based on sony's track record again you look at more so with what they've done with miles davis catalog i mean gosh since ever since the 16 and 24 bit remastering kind of like in the around the early 2000s roughly ever since that technology was available for mastering and remastering what they've done with the Miles Davis catalog was astounding in fact um, if I'm not mistaken the original engineer on those Miles Davis recordings was the guy that facilitated or oversaw the remastering. So a lot of that sort of classic 50s, maybe early 60s. Heck, I'm not sure I have to do my homework on it, but even maybe up, up Bitches Brew and Beyond was the same engineer. And I know like a lot of the earlier recordings, the you know, Kind of Blue, uh, Sketches of Spain, all of that. I think that was the same engineer. And again, they've retapped him during that period. I don't know if he's still alive now, but at least, like I said, on the advent of that 16-bit and then later 24-bit mastering, then they got that guy and it was, I mean, just absolutely immaculate. But, I mean, they've done a lot of stuff since then. I mean, the there's, you know, all kind of complete sets of sessions from key albums, like The Kind of Blue. Um, there's, um, like I said, a complete box of all of the Bitches Brew sessions. So, I mean, you're talking about things that are 
six, seven, eight, nine, ten discs of music on that. Um, again, you know, Bob Dylan is another one. Same thing, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten CDs. You know, so uh, I'm leaning more towards having a sign of the times deluxe. I mean, you know, let's just forget super deluxe is just something that I don't know. I guess that's what people are calling things now. But to me, this would be more than a super deluxe where it's just a bonus disc or bonus disc two or three bonus discs. I'm talking a legitimate box set where, again, it for something like sign of the times. That should be a seven to ten disc thing. You know, just, uh, you know, just the sessions surrounding that alone, you know, should qualify that for something that's expansive. And including, you know, key live performances and even the bonus DVD. You know, I, I think something like that should be in the hands of more so in the hands of Sony than Warner Brothers. Not that Warner Brothers is doing a bad job of things, but I don't know. I just have a feeling that Sony would just have they to me they just have better track record to me. So I don't know. We'll see. But what's most important is what do you think? Um do you think that all of the lockdown and then by the time we reopen and then by the time, you know, whether it takes a couple of months or three or four months to kind of get back into the swing of things once things reopen. Uh, do you think that Warner Brothers will get a shot at releasing one more big Prince release or a Prince reissue or a deluxe set before they have to turn the classic stuff over to Warner Brothers? Or they're just going to cut their losses this year and just go ahead and come 2021, find something during the year to roll out a big parade super deluxe. I don't know, leave me a comment and let me know your thoughts. And with that, we're going to move to our actually our third and final main topic today. And this is a little something I've been calling lemon cake gate and i know it's like everybody's like oh really do we want to talk about that and it's like yeah i know i don't want to talk about it either but uh it there seems to be such it, it caused such a number one division amongst prince fans and you know there's even key insiders that have been weighing in you know yay and nay and, you know, I would be sort of remiss as much as I would like to avoid it. Would be remiss not to just, I don't know, not even necessarily throw in an opinion, but try to uh, come to some kind of understanding and probably giving some perspective. Uh, it's almost like a Jerry Springer final thought, <laughs> almost. Um but here we go. Uh, going to cover so much ground. I'm going to start with basically the Prince Grammy tribute. Um, now, if you go on YouTube, actually, I'll post the link up in the com or the show notes section here. Um, check that out, because basically all of my thoughts surrounding the Prince tribute, the Grammy tribute, and how some of this relates to all this ridiculous controversy that's covered there. So it's basically my review of the Prince Grammy special. It's up on YouTube. So by all means, if you haven't checked it out, check it out. Um, but I guess, I don't know. Basically, this started with um, a post from Apollonia on social media uh, calling out Sheila E. on some things you know and basically it's it's a vent and it's a rant and as a human being that's allowed you know the problem is is that with social media and even a lot of us non-celebrities tend to fall into this trap 
sometimes we tend to really vent, you know, for venting, sometimes we make the mistake of getting a little too personal. And I know myself have said some really ridiculous things on this show. You know, it, it happens to all of us, you know, and not and that's not invalidating the the true source of the vent. Meaning that, you know, there was some things regarding uh, charity and where the money was going, uh, things of that nature, um, the money not going to the charity uh, was a bone of contention for Prince and, you know, it was a bone of contention for Apollonia as well because she helped participate in these events and understandably so, you know, if you lend your name to something that's supposed to benefit a worthy cause and if there is the least bit of scrutiny about that, yeah, have every, have every right to be upset. And that being said, you know, to go to social media, and especially at a time it was getting closer to the air date. And I don't, you know, none of us really know what precipitated the vent or the rant, or if it was a thing of, you know, enough is enough. You know, we don't know. You know, only she knows what led to it. But like I said, you know, the the key point of it was, you know, regarding money and charity and things of that nature. Um, on the other side, then, you know, uh, Shilly has a new single that's out entitled Lemon Cake. And I guess this was something uh, inspired by, you know, long and short of it, Prince's relationship with Lemon Cake. Uh, a lot of insiders took offense to that. And has taken to social media to voice their concerns and to basically, you know, I, I don't know, pr provide another context or another point of view. You know, as they say in Star Wars, the truths that we that we cling to are often held by a certain point of view. So. You know, I, you know, I'm thinking like, OK, yeah, this is something that's going to blow over in a few days. But this is, you know, it, it kind of snowballed. I don't know. Maybe it's leveling off now. You know, a lot of people aren't bringing it up as much or everybody said what they have to say about it. Um, you know, I'm not one to comment in great detail on social media, but I don't know, like I said, as a fan, and like I said, I kind of touched on it during the uh, Grammy tribute review uh, in regards to that. It's, it's one of those things where, you know, it's the age of celebrity. You know, you know if we look back on classical music and you know granted there were newspapers around there's tons of books about the lives of whoever you know Brahms Beethoven Bach and I don't know I don't know maybe if we really did some digging it'd probably be just as exciting as reading about a Michael Jackson or Whitney Houston or Madonna whatever but you know, really, you know, the only beef, and I mean, I'm sure there was probably musical beefs. I mean, you know, I'm sure some, you know, I'm sure Beethoven had a rival, but definitely probably the most um, talked about would be Mozart and Salieri. You know, that'd probably be the biggest, you know, that's the original, that's the original rap beef right there. But, you know, we live in this age where, you know, it's the age of celebrity, you know, and it comes out of old Hollywood. You know, because before then, you know, if you were a singer, you just went to sing, 
wherever you went. And I'm sure, you know, being on the road then was no different than being on the road today. And, you know, you had your followers, but it was never anything to the magnitude of what we have in this age of technology. Like I said, ever since the early 20th century and the age of Hollywood, through which out of that were created the gossip columnist. Uh, from there, the different tabloid press, your National Enquirers. And now we have these entertainment shows. We have reality shows. And we also have social media. And so through all of that, those 100 plus years of entertainment industry you know we've been conditioned to you know we see a headline you know on social media or the internet it's clickbait you know it's the sound bite it's the headline and we react to it um is there a valid argument to be made yeah, there's some elements of it. Um, there's some things that I've seen over the last few years. Yeah, could lend a lot of, you know, I, what I would perceive as some truth in the matter. But again, like I said, I'm going to lend a balanced perspective on this. And that basically, I know I'm a human being and I've said some pretty ridiculous stuff in my lifetime and done some pretty ridiculous stuff as well. So, and we're all guilty of that in some way, shape or form. Uh, but the, this sort of dividing line, you know, the bottom line is that our job basically is just react to the art, react to the performance, you know, and leave it at that. Very few, artists are adept at either expressing their true emotions or using their craft as a way to express the ills of what's going on, whether it's with themselves or whether it's society. And that's that. Very few are adept at doing that. And what we have here, there's, like I said, there's the dividing line you know, but at the end of the day, you know, our interest in Prince as a musician, as an artist, you know, like I said, him by his example, maybe being an inspiration. Yeah, that's that's something definitely to, you know, something to hold close to, enjoy, celebrate, honor. If it has relevance to your life, cool. If it doesn't, that's fine as well. But this sort of possessiveness, you know, and again, like I said, it's basically a reaction to at whatever point that an artist's work or their worldview or the example, it has a relevance to what's going on around you. Not necessarily direct, but... You know, what I go back to as far as the classic material. For me, I was at the perfect age for that to happen. So being 15, when Dirty Mind was happening in real time and controversy had yet to be released or the first time I heard controversy on the radio. First time hearing when doves cry on the radio, that the perfect age to hear that. So, of course, you're going to take it personally because that was the era that you belonged. Or whenever you didn't even have to be there in the 80s. Whatever period, whatever era, whatever song, whatever album that entered your life and how you responded to it. Then that's all that really at the end of the day just needs to be said. Um like I said, the infighting, uh, like I said, on the tribute review, you know, 
when you're in your 20s, your bachelor, and it's kind of cool to have that phone book, so to speak, or it's cool to run around and do that. But, you know, there are boundaries and there are levels of respect. And then there's also emotions. <laughs> you know, if somebody's aware of somebody else or not. And there's going to be a certain possess possessiveness. There's going to be a certain bit of jealousy. And, you know, now that everyone's feeling the void of this artist's absence. Yeah, there's still some emotions. Maybe some of that had been deep rooted for decades. Or, like I said, maybe it was born partially of that. And in addition to certain allegations as well you know um i will say this if you seek out the episode of unsung that focuses on shilla e i'll just say this watch it make up your own mind uh in addition to that check out the interview with Larry King as well and watch that and make up your own minds as well. But to have this sort of division amongst the fan base, I mean, everybody's got their favorites, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, I don't want to kind of say, you know, make protecting the legacy a cliche, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's really about us celebrating the music. Like I said, you know, I remember being, you know, 18, seeing the Glamorous Life video for the first time. And, you know, kind of a bit knocked out by that, you know. I mean, you know, the Romance 1600 album, you know, as a... You know, on a lot of levels, you know, I bought into the the image and that's what we all do. We just buy into the image because that's the image that's being presented. If it's, you know, the album concept, it's the album concept. If that's the album marketing, that's the album marketing. If that's the video, that's the video. It's doing what it's designed to do. And that's to draw us in and to get us into it and to go by the record. And like I said, whatever impact that that video or that record, you know. Like I said, you know, being 18, it's, you know, still a bit impressionable on some levels. And it's like, you know, that's the image, you know, hence the posters go on the wall. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, my favorite is the the third sort of Paisley Park album of hers. You know, that's, you know, that's my favorite album. Does what I see in a television interview or what I initially interpret as a bit of, I don't know what you want to call it, um, where it may look like opportunism. Does that affect my enjoyment of that album? Does it change me enjoying that album when I play it? No, not necessarily. Because, I mean, for me, a lot of times it's about the body of work. Now, there are some cases where there have been certain entertainers, be it they musicians, actors, actresses, that have done things so heinous that it's kind of like a done deal. It's like, I can't go back. No, I can't watch that film anymore. I can't have that record in my collection anymore. You know, there's that. But overall, in the general scheme of things, artists are people too. And their excellence is in the body of work. Whatever ups and downs, whatever good days, whatever bad days, they've had it kind of becomes not necessarily irrelevant but nothing to get so caught up in 
you know, that it kind of distracts what you would need to focus on in your everyday life. So, you know, a lot of the negative comments or the heated comments and things of that nature, it's just, you know, it's a couple of entertainers because it's between them. They're the ones fighting. You know, we don't know these people personally. We don't know what motivated the rant. We don't know if there is opportunism going on or a feeling of slight or neglect or ego or anything. That's the motivation. We don't know. Now, you know, did it um, did it take away from the tribute being enjoyable? No. Um, like I said, go ahead and check out my review of it. Um, everything is there in that. Um, but I will say again, I enjoyed it more than I thought I would. Um, and again, like most tributes, there are people that did extremely well. And of course, there's a few performances that fell a little flat to me as well. Um, did she do a great job as musical director? Yeah, I think she did an outstanding job as musical director. Um, now, there has been some criticism of there was too much focus on her. And like I said in my review that's on YouTube, it reminded me of the Let It Be film, which the the big takeaway from the Beatles on that one was that the focus was too much on Paul. The camera was always on Paul and it kind of focused on the negative. Not that the tribute had anything negative about it, um, but yeah, it was just a lot of focus where I felt for a couple of numbers, yeah, I think the focus should have been more so on the actual performer, uh, but granted, I guess, you know, maybe I have to go back over the song list and everything. But if they were songs, say, like where if she was part of the Love Sexy Band in that regard, then I get it, you know. Um, you know but I thought as a musical director, I, again, like I said, thought she did a very outstanding job. Um, and as far as, I don't know, you know, the... You know, I'm sure there were producers and things of that show as well. And you have to remember, for those that are only thinking this, the, oh, the focus was only on the 80s material, and that being a bone of contention for a lot of people, I will say this, my initial thought, up until I saw the, actually saw the revolution, I felt that they should have been more of the house band as well, and then still kind of had their moments out front at the same time meaning that they could have been good backing, especially like a lot of the, you know, Purple Rain era material, around the world in the day material, that they would have been the better fit for that. And then have a moment where it's them center stage, you know, maybe towards the end, like they did with Delirious and Purple Rain. Um, but... Again, like I said, we don't know what the logistics were. We don't know if, say, like the MPG had shows booked initially, could not make it. Other key members of the NPG could have been part of the house band. Who knows? But she elected to have her band, and I don't know if that's just a matter of timing, whether it's a matter of economics, were other band members approached and wanted too much money. Who knows? Were they omitted on purpose? Um, there were rumors that uh, the revolution was grossly overlooked, but Jimmy Jam stepped in and got them their spot on the show. Now, I thought overall it was pretty good. Like I said, it didn't necessarily change my opinion on tributes overall, but for Prince, given what it was and the way it was put together, I thought it definitely rose to the occasion. So, um, again, you know, I mean, I get people that didn't enjoy it. I get the people that felt like it only focused on just the 80s material. But, again, keep in mind what this is for. This is network television. Now, 
if this was something that was produced for Netflix, I almost want to say maybe, uh, no, leave the cable out of it. Let's just say for argument's sake, if this was something that was going to be a Netflix only event or a Hulu only event, then I would say it would be better if the representation yeah you could have that full representation you can have the revolution there you can have the npg there you can have this associated artist you can have you could bring in the, and andy allo you can bring in a uh, judith hill you know you can bring in third eye girl you can bring them in and you can have it long enough no commercial breaks and have it a full on show, you know, tape all the, you know, performances in full, you know, and maybe break it down to everyone's best, you know, four, five, six song performance. And like I said, have every era represented and do it that way. But you're talking about network television. And I mean, even in this day and age, network television is still a good 30 years behind the curve still. So basically what this show is aimed for, they're not aimed for the Prince fans necessarily. It's just that, yeah, Prince is a legendary artist, you know, like an Elvis, like a Michael Jackson, like the Beatles, like a Stevie Wonder. So when they do these, this is for the masses that, yeah, they know Prince's name. They're familiar with a lot of stuff, but Purple Rain is sort of that the big one. That's the one that really put him in all of America's households. 1999 was the album that sort of put him in the households where the kids watched MTV. You know, the rest of us, you know, from any black neighborhood USA, we were there since soft and wet for the majority, or at least dirty mind for the earliest. So there, you know, that's the show that's aimed for that sort of either that generation or the mainstream. Now, that being said, if there was somebody that was either around in the 80s and was like, yeah, okay, you know, I got Purple Rain and, you know, I've got the album with Kiss on it, you know, and then just lost track afterwards. And then they tuned into that show. It was like, oh, yeah, I remember that. I've got, yeah, you know, and they go back and whether they buy the greatest hits, whether they pick up an album or an additional album, great. You know, do that. Um, then again, there's newbies of whatever age, you know, like I said, this show, it did so well in the ratings. And I think as a testament to the magnitude of the whole stay at home movement that we're, you know, a lot of people are just starved for entertainment. You know, that was the go-to program and that was the perfect timing for that. And then you've got this wealth of eighties material, but ladies and gentlemen, when these people, they turn it on and go, Oh, he did that song or he did that song. Oh, he's got these, this body of hits then you can best believe when they go on their Apple Music or when they go on Spotify or when they go on Tidal or wherever and they can check out the rest of the catalog. It's there. So it's like, oh, well, he had these big hits in the 80s. Well, what are these other albums? You know, it's there for them to discover. You know, think about, and I'm not talking about, like, in, like I said, in my case, Prince was unfolding in real time. You know, Dirty Mind was already out when I got on board. And I had already heard stuff from the first two albums prior to that. But Dirty Mind was sort of my gateway. You know, never mind about that. Um, but think about, you know, the the teenager or the co or like for me, I know a lot of stuff where there was jazz I was aware of reggae, enjoyed some of it, but I really didn't get into reggae until college. So if you think about the teenagers or the college age kids or whatever age 
and you're discovering a group that may have been around forever, whether they were around in the 50s or around in the 60s, and you're just now discovering it now, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, whatever you're just discovering now, doesn't matter when it came out or what era it represented. That's your gateway now. So whatever album that person jumps on board at whatever age, don't worry, they'll find the they'll find the, the legendary bootlegs. You know, they'll Google search and you know, or go on title and Spotify. And then if they get even deeper, then they're going to discover the Prince podcast. You know, they're going to discover Michael Dean. They're going to discover Muse to the Pharaoh. They're going to discover Prince's friend that's going to break all this down to them. You know, they'll discover Amari Purple Talk and get my perspective on it as well. So I don't really get too pissed off at having, you know, it's just the 80. For that particular platform that's perfect but then now if you do the netflix special or hey take it to the next step you know it may not be this coming year in the years to come if they decide to film these uh print celebrations at paisley park and like i said whether it goes on a netflix and or whether it goes on Hulu or whoever, Apple TV, heck, Disney Plus, whoever they decide to market this to, you know, HBO Now. Then if they film the entire weekend. And then the only thing that will be on Netflix or Apple TV or HBO Now or Hulu is just the revolution and they've ignored Oh, the original time got back together for, you know, 2022 Prince celebration or, you know, there's, you know, Sheila E. And then there's, you know, who, um, you know, F Deluxe, Andre Simone, you know, if they got ignored or, you know, the NPG had probably had the best set of the whole week. And that stuff gets on the cutting room floor and they just show, oh, here's the revolution and here's let's go crazy again, folks. Here's I would die for you again, folks. If that happens on one of those platforms, then, yeah, I would be highly upset and the rest of you should be highly upset as well. But for network television, I think that was good enough. That was just absolutely perfect for what that was. And like I said, I hope new people jump on board. Like I said, if people were around for whatever purple rain and they jumped off at parade or they jumped off at sign of the times and they discover like, Oh, well, here's about 30 albums more <laughs> of stuff. Oh, I didn't know he did that in 1994. Oh, I didn't know he did that in 95. What's this emancipation about? And again, like I said, they'll, you know, and if you dig, deep enough like I said you'll discover the bootlegs you know they'll discover the different podcasts you know they'll discover my Amari Purple Talk Emancipation special and see what all the fuss was about like oh I missed that in the 90s whoa okay you know job is done you know and then for newbies that are listening you know, that are taking that deeper dive. As I was listening to the show notes, or listening to the show, as I was preparing for the show, yeah, I was jamming Artificial Age, you know, which is actually my favorite post, or I should say my modern, favorite modern classic Prince album. Because to me, there's some songs that are just classic. Black Sweat is a classic. To me, Black Sweat stands up to anything and everything in the classic era. Album-wise, B-side-wise, it stands up. To me, Magnificent, as a B-side, a virtual B-side, stands up to any classic Prince B-side to me. 
I love the classic B-sides. You know, She's Always In My Hair is my favorite classic one. And so it's there. You know, it's there for everybody to discover. So, yeah, like I said, I, it doesn't change my mind about tributes. I'm still not a fan of tributes. But as far as that one went, I had a really great time watching it. Um, again, check out my review. I go over each and every act and kind of weigh my thoughts in about it. Um, in fact, a couple of people, uh, her, I still have to take time out and really listen to her music because, you know, there's a younger generation plays their own instruments. And I mean, plays, you know, that amplifier was on, you know, and not too bad on the piano as well. So, you know, so all is not lost. You know, I hope it does kind of set the stage for you know, these kids to discover, you know, bands are never going to last long. There's always going to be those classic, you know, behind the music stories, unfortunately. But let's hope that for the duration that these kids can put groups together or let's bring back real singers. Let's bring back actual artists. It's cool to use the computers, but you know, do something different with the computer than what 20 other people that are supposed to be the hot producers are doing. You know, if all 20 are doing the same beat, then you find your own lane. Or as Prince once said, hey, the best way to be me is to be yourself. You know, forget about what the record companies think everybody should sound like. Therefore, as you're watching whoever you like and trying to emulate ignore that be yourself own your work and you know defend it on its merit so anyway that, that's my thought on that and like I said the whole lemon cake thing I'm glad it's put to rest now hopefully but um, again like I said the whatever allegations there are whatever motivated the rants. Hopefully there's not opportunism going on on either side, because the other thing, too, is you, you probably just shouldn't be promoting your upcoming book while you're venting about, you know, said allegations. Again, like I said, I've said stupid things, too, on social media. So there you have it. So we're all guilty of it. You guys are guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. Here we're watching somebody that we've seen in a movie that we've loved for generations. You know, we're watching somebody whose records we've enjoyed. And it's like, hopefully those allegations aren't true because it's like, you know, you are an accomplished and respected musician and granted, you really don't need Prince at this stage. You know, there were a couple of albums that you did, even though they weren't mainstream hits. But, you know, they were music. It was music on your own terms. And it was so different from the whole purple musical singularity as well. You know, there's that. And as far as tribute songs, you know, you, you've you done one already, you know, and I was a little disappointed in that one. I mean, I get it. It's a tribute, but, you know, and it's heartfelt and that's OK. I just wasn't, you know, um, to me, I think initially the Jill Jones one I mentioned to me that was the best uh Moore's Days Over the Rainbow it was okay but the thing is was that was born out of the immediacy of the situation it was them actually pouring so those things come through you know so those I've enjoyed on that level I can't even play them now you know but hearing them then you know, that's the impression I got. And like I said, I think Jill's was the best on that one. Like I said, Morris's was pretty good as well. But like I said, it was the emotions are there. 
it's they're both heartfelt and not to say that Sheila's on her heart heartfelt either just as reaching me as a listener not quite so I'm looking forward to like I said her doing records on pretty much on her merit and not you know going back and remaking America or going back and you know back to the purple well so to speak you know it's like I said you know you've worked with Lionel you've worked with George Duke you know, I want to see kind of that. But, I mean, that's just me. You know, I just host a podcast show. I'm not an executive producer. And I'm only cool at producing my stuff. So, <laughs> that's that. So, with all of that being said, you know, let's go back to enjoying the music. And dealing with each piece of art on its own merit. And, of course, we're fans. If somebody puts out a book. Nine times out of ten, we'll check it out, we'll read it, and just go from there, you know. And it's all, books are just all information. It's how you process it and internalize it in, or how you deal with it in your life is what really matters. So, but at the end of the day, it's just information. And if it's useful, cool. If it has relevance, cool. If not then you either read a good book or you read a bad book. And there you have it, and life goes on. So that's going to end this topic. And actually, it's going to end this show. You know, lots of things are changing, and they're changing by the minute. And we just, you know, I know all of us are having a hard time really just dealing with all the changes, you know, wondering when things will get back to normal, when things will reopen and all of that. Um, just this week, you know, I'm thinking about the show and everything. Not that I'll radically change it, um, but there'll probably be some changes to the show in the coming weeks ahead. Um, again, things to check out. My What's in the Crate blog post it's on wordpress so look up what's in the crate wordpress.com if you go to my website all the links to everything that i'm doing is on there um but check that out the most recent one is about prince's parade album so definitely check that out uh, i'll do some more prince albums somewhere down the road with that um also the first Hits in the B-Sides segment on YouTube, where it's just kind of like the greatest hits and greatest misses of topics on old episodes of Amari Purple Talk. So check that out as well. Oh, and has uh, anyone seen the, was it four, maybe five days of quest love spinning for like four or five hours at a time nothing but prints i mean um go on the roots uh youtube channel uh, i was uh, just stumbled upon i guess one of the days um and it was dealing with all the associated acts uh that he was doing all the mixing and spinning man that was phenomenal now to me that was better than the televised tribute almost. I mean, because, I mean, he left no purple stone unturned on that. And it's, you know, no matter where you tune in, it's just, I mean, it's just amazing. And, you know, I'm a fan of DJs anyway. You know, to me, that's, I don't know if it's become a lost art but, you know, there's a lot more people doing it now, and it's sort of like a good side hustle or a side gig. But, you know, Questlove is somebody that's hip hop, you know, and, you know, it's just like, to me, you know, like, I go back to the Grandmaster Flash and, you know, the Jazzy Jeffs, the DJ Premiers. You know, the, 
you know, the RZA's, you know, just the great classic DJs, you know, it's like, you know, it's like Hendrix, you know, listening to those guys, you know, and I kind of just miss that era of it, you know, but to, to hear that type of DJing in the context of Prince was, I mean, that was just amazing to me. And that was, you know, that's where that was, you know, of course, I think, you know, we'd all would have loved to have attended celebration, but in spirit to me, those four days of DJing the whole Prince world, that was the Prince celebration in spirit. And I think that was a more truthful representation to me. And like I said, again, you know, the Prince tribute was network television and stuff. But um, yeah, like I said, check that out for sure. And that is going to end this episode. Uh, next week, we will have our Purple Spotlight back. Uh, we'll have our Bite the Boot segment back. Uh, like I said, you know, with the lockdown, not a lot's going on. So nothing going on with the associated acts either. So it's kind of getting a little bit more challenging to come up with something new every week. Um, but if you guys have any topic ideas or questions, uh, you can reach out to me on Twitter at Richard Cole underscore now. And of course the now is in all capital letters. Um, use the hashtag Amari Purple Talk and I will definitely make your question or topic one of the main topics of the show. Give you a shout out as well. And as always, stay healthy. Let's do what we can to survive. And once we do that, Let's leave this planet a little bit better than how we found it. Or let's leave it a lot better than how we found it. And let's do that and keep it purple and on the one. <laughs>